Thanks for joining the Explore, Explain and Sustain seminar series of IBSS uh, at Cat Academy. So my name is Michelle Achlavnis. Uh, I'm a postdoctoral fellow at IBSS uh, working on coral reef sponges. And so last week uh, we enjoyed a very nice seminar about microbes in corals. And today we will continue on a similar theme, but this time exploring the symbiosis between microbes and sponges. So sponges host uh, very uh, diverse and rich microbial communities uh, that have important functions uh, for the sponge itself, but also for the surrounding ecosystem. And so to explore this uh, very exciting and fast growing field of research, uh, we've invited uh, Dr. Cara uh, Fiore from Appalachian State University to join us today. Um, so Cara has been working with sponges ever since her master's that was at the College of Charleston. Uh, she then completed her PhD in microbiology at the University of New Hampshire, where she was mentored uh, by Michael Lesser. Uh, afterwards, uh, she did some postdoctoral work on marine metabolomics at Woods Hole. Uh, and now she's joining us from North Carolina, where she's an assistant professor of biology. So although she has a, a quite broad um, research interests, uh, she focuses on host microbe interactions and the resulting nutrient cycling, particularly on coral reefs. Uh, and so she'll tell us all about this in her seminar, uh, which is titled Sponge Microbe Symbiosis as an Important Driver in Sponge and Coral Reef Ecology. So just quickly before we begin, there's a few logistical notes for all of you. So if you're just um, coming in, please remember uh, to mute your microphones and keep your cameras off uh, during the entire talk. At the end, we'll have a discussion. Uh, so if you have questions for the speaker, please uh, raise your hand or type a question mark in the chat. And then I'll call on you so that you can turn on your microphone and pose the question. Um, so to raise your hand in Zoom, I believe you need to go down um, to the participants uh, area and click on that and then you can see your name and next to it there is a little hand that you can click on. And finally before we begin I do want to let you all know that this seminar is being recorded so if you do not wish to be recorded um, perhaps you'd like to hop off now and then you can watch the recording at a later time point. So that's all from me I believe. So Cara welcome and the floor is yours. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Michelle, for that um, very nice introduction. And uh, let me get my screen set up here. All right. Great. Um, so, yeah, I really appreciate um, the opportunity to share um, my research with you all. So thank you all for coming and thank you for the invitation. Um, and as Michelle said, so I'm going to focus um, this talk today on the sponge microbe symbiosis work that I've been doing. And the first part of the talk is going to be mainly focused on cor coral reefs, but I'm going to talk a little bit about some freshwater sponge work as well. So I thought I'd start with a little bit of background both on myself and on sponges in general. So um, during my doctoral work uh, at the University of New Hampshire, I focused uh, largely on this sponge, the giant barrel sponge, Zesto spongia muta. And sponges in general have a relatively simple body plan. So they draw water in through pores on the outside of their body. And then this is, um, processed uh, out through essential osculum or multiple oscula. And in this process, they're able to filter bacteria and other particulates out for food. But in addition to this, uh, sponges are also known uh, to host these dense, often dense and diverse communities of microbes, um, as Michelle mentioned as well. And um, I really like this image here that I've taken from a paper by Usher and colleagues. And what this shows is a cross section through a sponge tissue and it's a transmission electron microscopy image. And I'll point out if you can see my cursor over here, um, there are some sponge cells here and a little bit at the edge here and down here. 
but all of these different shapes and size cells that you see, most of those are actually prokaryotic cells. So bacteria and archaea that live in the sponge, just like we have a microbiome on our skin and in our gut, sponges also have microbiome that's important to their functioning. Um, and one of the unique things about sponges is that when we take together this microbial community with its diverse metabolism and the ability of the sponge to pump and filter vast amounts of water, that sponges can have a pretty substantial impact on the surrounding seawater chemistry. And so I was interested in really both of these aspects during my PhD, sort of the symbiosis aspect as well as the nutrient dynamics. And so some of the approaches that I used um, were things like a metatranscriptome, which um, if you're familiar with that and maybe familiar with keg pathways, this might look familiar to you, this little snapshot. But if not, it really just allows us to kind of get a snapshot of the functional um, role of these symbionts. So, you know, what kind of nutrients can they use and how can they use them? So we can start to glean some of that information from that approach. And then I also calculated nutrient fluxes. So thinking about what this kind of genotype uh, and phenotype means for nutrient dynamics on coral reef. So hosting these microbes, um, what kind of impact does that have for inorganic nitrogen in particular? Um, and nitrogen is something that I'll, I'll talk again about during this talk. Um, what does that mean for nitrogen availability in the seawater? Um, and I'll highlight kind of carbon, thinking about nutrients like carbon and nitrogen here, because those are things that are going to come up again um, later in the talk. So generally, sponges live in sort of um, in coral reefs and there's nutrient poor water. So those nutrients like carbon and nitrogen are important. And then uh, in my postdoc, um, I shifted gears a little bit to work on uh, free living marine microbes, and I used a different approach. Um, which was metabolomics and used uh, what's called mass spectrometry to be able to then um, uh, identify and characterize some of these um, metabolic compounds. So getting at function in a little different way. And what that means really was just being able to identify um, things like amino acids and vitamins. And so um, getting a little bit different angle on uh, nutrient dynamics in that way. And so these are all factors that are um, going to lead into the, the main NSF projects that I have going now that um, I'm gonna share with you today. Um, so what that's gonna look like here is um, kind of an overview of three main projects. And all of these are pretty early stages. Um, so it is going to be an overview of some of the microbial ecology of sponges, and then um, we'll shift to thinking about the nutrient uh, part of it, nutrient cycling on coral reefs, and then um, a little bit of a fun story on these freshwater sponges. So I'm going to start with microbial ecology. Um, and what I wanted to show you here is a video of sponge pumping because um, it sort of captures sort of this impact that sponges can have uh, on a reef. And so I'm going to play this here. It's not too loud. You'll see me add some fluorescein dye at the base of the sponge, and then you'll see that get pumped up through the sponge. So through the osculum here. And so you can see, right, that these sponges are pretty impressive um, filter feeding animals. And so if you think about uh, the impact that maybe one sponge can have and think about um, the impact that these have on nutrient dynamics across a whole reef. So during my PhD, um, I was largely focused on sort of some of the mechanistic type questions involved in sort of the symbiosis and nutrients. Um, but really over the past few years, um, it was in conversations with colleagues, I started to think about um, how symbionts might influence sort of larger scale processes like the ecology and evolution of their host. And so um, together with several colleagues we were drawn to this question here. So what supports this biodiversity? So coral reefs are found in what's considered the equivalent of a marine desert. So they're in these oligotrophic um, oceans. So they have low nutrients. And um, so with corals, we know that a big factor in their success has been the symbiotic association with algal symbionts. But for sponges, the answer to this question is less clear. 
And particularly when we think about uh, sponges in the Caribbean, where we see some of the highest um, species richness and high bio, highest biomass of sponges, you know, how is this possible in a nutrient poor environment? Well, to start to answer this question, uh, I'm going to bring in some sort of traditional ecology. So there's been an idea in the literature for years now that the Caribbean um, is actually not really limited in nutrients and particularly thinking about carbon here. And that's because the thought is there's high terrestrial runoff. So that brings nutrients from land into the water and then this leads to high productivity in the Caribbean, and so plenty of bacteria and particulates for sponges. So essentially kind of an all-you-can-eat buffet for sponges. And so in this scenario, the sponge um, species assemblage that we see would be shaped by factors other than uh, limiting nutrients, limiting resources. In contrast, if we consider um, the idea that maybe some resources are limiting, which is more of how we traditionally think of coral reefs, then we might see something like this, where we have um, at time point one species overlap and sort of they're sharing um, an overlap in the range of resources used and overlap in niche. And then by time point two, we actually see them separate. And so we have this kind of what we call niche partitioning or separation of resources that are used. So what does this mean to sponges? How might we apply this to sponges? Um, well, an important factor here is what are those resources? So essentially, what are they eating? And what that comes down to is thinking about, you know, are they in fact all heterotrophs, um, which is how we typically think of sponges, uh, particularly in the Caribbean. Um, and really what has been um, kind of a pervasive um, idea in the literature is that most sponges are heterotrophs, there have been a few examples, sort of classic examples of phototrophic sponges in the Great Barrier Reef. And those would be kind of um, analogous to corals in that they would host photosymbionts and derive some carbon, some nutrients from those photosymbionts. Um, so <clears throat> this really leads me to then this question here, are all sponges heterotrophs? And uh, in digging into this question with some colleagues, uh, what we found is that we could sort of trace this idea of really thinking about sponges as heterotrophs, particularly in the Caribbean, to a handful of papers um, published in uh, the 80s and into 1990. And so what we see here is that um, there's this paper by Wilkinson published in 1983 in Science. Um, and I'm not really sure, can you see, um, I'm just gonna move that bar. I'm not really sure if that comes across on your screen or not, but let me move that out of the way. Okay, um, so this paper by Wilkinson in 1983, um, and then another paper by Wilkinson in 1987, also published in Science. And in these papers, what he did was to really highlight this difference in nutritional strategy and difference in um, sort of trajectories of evolution of these populations of sponges in the Caribbean versus the Great Barrier Reef. And what he um, suggested, suggested is that in the Caribbean, we see heterotrophic sponges and they have different morphology, much bigger size. So we have vase-shaped sponges, uh, rope-shaped sponges, mounding. Um, and what he found is that in the Great Barrier Reef, you see um, examples of phototrophic sponges um, that tend to be very small, tend to be flat and foliose and sort of well adapted to kind of capture light for their photosymbionts, um, much the same way corals are. Um, and so this, along with uh, his paper um, by Wilkinson and Cheshire in 1990, sort of drove home this this idea that sponges in the Caribbean are heterotrophic um, and that this was really a result of higher productivity in the Caribbean. And then uh, they suggested that in the Great Barrier Reef, however, you do see a mix of heterotrophy and phototrophic sponges. And so this, um, these papers actually really helped shape for many years how we think about uh, the role of symbionts in sponges and how we think about um, the evolutionary strategy of sponges on coral reefs. 
And while um, the methods that they did, they did some really great work at this time, um, we have the ability now to sort of get at a question about a symbiont derived benefit for the host, um, a role of symbionts in the host using stable isotope approaches and a variety of other methods to sort of more precisely get at that question. Um, and so um, what I also want to highlight here is that aside from thinking about particulates for food for the sponge um, and then potentially symbiont derived nutrients like carbon from photosymbionts, that there's actually a third factor to consider here. And that is uh, a third resource that is the dissolved nutrients in seawater. And so particularly so, uh, dissolved organic carbon. And if you think about you know, just taking some sugar like glucose, uh, dissolving that in some water, that would be an example of dissolved organic carbon. And so in seawater, we have sugars, uh, amino acids, vitamins, as well as more complex molecules that all make up these dissolved organic nutrients. Um, and so <clears throat> we've actually known for a while that in addition to feeding on the plankton, um, that sponges can also consume this dissolved organic nutrients. Um, and this figure from uh, Morganti and colleagues uh, shows this really nicely. So we've got DOC concentration on the x-axis and then DOC removal rate on the y. And what we see is that as there's an increase in DOC concentration, uh, there's an increase in removal rate in general. Um, these different shapes um, and the black and white uh, color here indicate different sponge species. So another important factor here is that we actually do see some variability in this capacity across species. And this was shown um, actually really nicely by um, several papers out of this group, Morganti and colleagues, as well as a few other papers. So we can see that now we know at least in addition to plankton, we know that there's uh, the potential for dissolved nutrients. And then another major question was, okay, so if they're taking up these dissolved nutrients, but is this um, the actual sponge that's doing it? Does it matter for the sponge or is it the microbial community that's doing that? And so here I want to highlight um, very quickly uh, an image here from um, the pap a paper by Michelle here, Michelle Acleras. And this is a transmission electron microscopy image of, and you can see some sponge cells here. That's what these big cells are here. And then I'm not going to go into detail here, but I'll just highlight that the colors in these bottom images um, give us an idea about a nitrogen signal or a carbon signal. Um, and so when we feed them these um, labeled kind of nitrogen or carbon compounds, we can see if they're taken up or not. And, uh, what they were able to show is that the microbial community, as well as the sponge cell, um, can directly take up uh, this carbon. So we could see that um, both the sponge cells and the uh, microbial community could take this up. And this was a big deal, especially to see that the sponge cells could do this directly. Um, and this was really exciting because um, what it tells us is that there are more ways for sponges to access resources, right? So we've kind of got the plankton, we've got these dissolved nutrients, um, but we also see that there's some variability across species. So now what does this all mean for uh, resource limitation and biodiversity? Uh, well, there's actually one more piece of the puzzle that I'm going to share uh, before trying to bring that together. Um, and this is from a recent paper by some colleagues of mine uh, published uh, last year. And what they did was to use um, stable isotope analysis for both carbon and nitrogen. And this approach is really nice because it allows us to sort of um, figure out what, um, how different sponges are sort of separated by what they eat. So what their carbon and nitrogen sources are. Um, and so what you see here is you can just think of this as sort of a range in carbon signal on the x-axis and then a range in nitrogen signal on the y-axis. Um, and so what they did was to sample these sponges for this natural abundance of stable isotopes. Um, and these colors correspond to different sponge species that are all um, from one reef. And so what you can see is that on a reef, 
they in fact do not look like they're all doing the same thing. They're, right? they're not necessarily all consuming the same food because we sort of see these different um, resource pools where they look different for different species. And we see that this separates out a little bit by carbon, but perhaps even more so by the vertical ac axis here with nitrogen. And so uh, what this means is that one, nitrogen may actually be a more important sort of niche defining uh, factor than carbon, which has traditionally been the focus of this, um, this idea of how, um, of what sponges are consuming um, and whether or not there's uh, niche partitioning on the reefs. Um, and also that we know that some species do host uh, dense communities of photosymbionts and including sponges in the Caribbean. So uh, this uh, fluorescence picture here shows a cross section through a sponge and the green kind of greenish yellow that you see, that's all sponge cells. And you can see that there's a canal here. And so the orange that you see kind of pervasive throughout the, um, the sponge tissue here, those are all cyanobacterial symbionts. And what we know is that um, even for sponges in the Caribbean, that um, those that host dense communities of cyanobacteria can get some of their carbon and or nitrogen from their symbionts. Um, and then there's also the potential for other sources of nutrients from a variety of other symbionts. Uh, within here. So what we see is that we can start to put together this uh, puzzle of sponge metabolism in maybe a little bit more complicated way than just thinking about heterotrophy. So you've got a particulate um, organic matter, the particulate component, as well as dissolved organic nutrients, and then carbon and nitrogen um, from their symbionts. And we actually know that even within these three pools, um, that there's variability um, or different types of resources that are available uh, within these three different pools. And so now we're starting to put together this more complicated picture of sponge resource use and potential niche partitioning um, and potential differences in symbiont derived benefit to these uh, hosts across species. So really, um, with my collaborators, we thought it was time to revisit some of this historical work um, and think about sponge metabolism in a little different way to see if uh, what kind of role the symbiont community may actually have in host uh, dif ecological diversification. Um, and so this is our main question here, which is, you know, do microbial symbionts mediate host diversification? And so these are my uh, collaborators on this project. So Bob Thacker, Chris Freeman, and Cole Eason. And um, we thought that one of the best places to test this idea um, that, that symbionts um, may have some role in uh, the host diversification and the, the idea for a sort of this resource partitioning across species um, that a really great place to test that would be the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Bocas del Toro, Panama. And that's because um, in Bocas del Toro, there's high uh, nutrient runoff. Um, it's fairly uh, nutrient rich, particularly near, um, near shore. And so in this nutrient, relatively nutrient rich environment, if we can find differences in resource use um, across coexisting species and particularly even find phototrophic sponges, that this would really kind of shake up the paradigm um, set up by Wilkinson and Cheshire um, back in the, in the 80s and into the early 90s. So we have begun some work on this project um, to test the hypothesis, um, our goal is to use a set of stable isotope tracer experiments. Um, and these will allow us to sort of characterize um, uh, heterotrophic and autotrophic pathways by the symbionts, by the host. Um, so we can start to kind of trace that and piece it together using these stable isotope. Uh, tracer experiments. And so this shows kind of one image of our setup here where we had some tanks um, with sponges in them. And this shows you one example here of this cute little sponge, Michaeli Levis. Um, and so fortunately, we were able to complete phase one in 2019. Um, we're still processing those samples. Um, 
uh, we have, uh, fortunately, I guess, uh, many, many samples to process. Um, and then we also were able to kind of pair this with some in situ sampling. And in 2019, really what we started to do was kind of test out methods for doing these collections. So the in situ part would consist of sorry, collecting inhalant and exhalant um, seawater from the sponge. So water as it enters and leaves the sponge and look at this kind of nutrient profile um, across species. And so uh, while we're working on these uh, um, samples that we have from these experiments, then we had planned, of course, to go back in 2020. And um, like for everybody, things sort of got shifted quite a bit. We postponed our trip there entirely in 2020. Um, and we're looking now trying to sort of figure out what the best approach is to keep going. And we may end up shifting and kind of moving this project uh, from Panama, but it, um, to somewhere a little bit closer that we can get to easier. But um, it would allow us to at least keep the project going. Um, and so either way, um, I'm hoping that uh, very shortly we'll have some excite exciting results to share on this front. And so now I'm going to shift gears just a little bit, um, still on coral reef sponges, but thinking about um, their impact to the environment. So looking at these dissolved organic nutrients. And so to do that, um, I'm going to take a very brief step back to my postdoc work um, at Woods Hole. And there um, I was interested, and in, as I mentioned, in using some of these um, metabolomics techniques that allow us to get um, sort of a different view of function in these uh, sponges or microbes. Um, during my postdoc, I was mainly working on free living microbes, so some cyanobacteria and apicoeukaryote. Um, but I was also able to apply these techniques, um, and I'll talk about what that means shortly, to uh, sponge microbe system. And so for this, though, I want to give a little bit of background um, around the time that I was starting my postdoc. So around that time, it wasn't long before um, this paper had come out um, on the sponge loop, and this was published in Science. Um, and what they are able to show really nicely in this paper is that sponges can act as sort of this conduit, moving uh, dissolved organic nutrients from the water column into the benthic food web. So sponges are taking up these dissolved nutrients, turning it into biomass, and then um, shedding some of that cells and detritus that was then uh, moving into the benthic food web. So they were able to show this really nicely using a set of stable isotope tracer experiments. Um, and so around this time, though, I was also very curious to see if, in addition to this idea of a sponge loop, if there would be sort of another component to this loop, which is um, what the sponges might be releasing back into the water column for dissolved organic nutrients. Um, another paper that was kind of instrumental to my thinking at the time as I was doing my postdoc uh, was a, a paper that was, had compared uh, the dissolved organic nutrient profile from corals and from algae. And so here they are able to show that the dissolved nutrients and particularly focusing on sugars here were different between corals and between algae. And that this actually was had a pretty big impact on the overlying uh, pelagic microbial community with potential impacts for corals. Because what they found is that the um, dissolved organic carbon released by uh, algae actually drove a more heterotrophic microbial community in the water column. And this included uh, the presence of microbes that are opportunistic pathogens with potential negative consequences for corals. In contrast, they found that uh, the dissolved organic nutrients um, and the sugars released from corals in particular were different than from algae, and these tended to drive a more autotrophic community and something that we might typically think of as what you find in sort of a more healthy reef. And so as you then might imagine, um, I was very curious to see how sponges would fit into this picture. And so what I did um, was to start um, a, a side project um, and I was able to fund that work using a crowdfunding platform called Experiment. Um, 
And so I was able to um, set that up to answer um, or to address this question. So how do sponges influence the availability of nutrients on coral reefs? Um, and as part of the project, um, I you know, wrote blog posts, um, uh, wrote blogs about sponges, wrote blogs from uh, the field and uh, while I was doing data analysis and all of this and had some um, really good feedback and it was actually a lot of fun. Uh, but fortunately, it was able to get funded. And once I had that funding, um, it was able to go to the Florida Keys to do this um, very small scale pilot project. So me and uh, with the help of some really great colleagues um, who helped me collect these samples, um, that's what I want to share here. So what we have here are um, the schematic of the collections that I did. So I collected inhalant seawater and exhalant seawater, and um, specifically from two different sponges that I knew varied in their microbial community. So uh, different in sort of density and diversity of microbes. Um, and so I was able to collect the exhalant water uh, just using a syringe to isolate that exhalant water from the ambient surrounding seawater. So we collected some samples of inhalant, exhalant, and then some samples from sort of away from the reef, although we really weren't that far away from the reef, I will say. Um, so once I had these seawater samples in hand, uh, what I did was to then filter that water and then extract those dissolved organic nutrients and then process those dissolved nutrients to kind of get a profile of what these samples look like for you know, their dissolved nutrients. So I did that using the metabolomics techniques that I mentioned. So an untargeted approach and then a targeted approach. And really what this allows us to do is with the untargeted, we can sort of get a swath um, of any, you know, uh, sugars and amino acids, nucleosides, vitamins, all of those things um, that might fall, uh, that we could capture with our methods. Although we don't necessarily have the identity of them. And then with the targeted approach, we actually have the identity and can quantify those metabolites. So I'm gonna talk um, or share some of kind of the highlights from that, from that work. And so first is from the untargeted work. So kind of getting a big picture overview of the profile of these dissolved organic nutrients. And what I was expecting to happen or hoped would happen is that I'd see a dissolved uh, organic nutrient profile that was very different in the exhalant seawater from the inhalant seawater. And then potentially um, a, whole, a third group that was the off reef uh, samples. And so what I did see um, is shown here on this NMDS. And on this plot, so some of these points that are closer together would be more similar in their uh, dissolved organic nutrient profile. And then if they're farther apart, they're different in their profile. And so what I saw is that in fact, yes, um, so the stars represent the exhalant seawater, the circles represent the inhalant seawater. Um, and those are um, were distinct, right? We could certainly see that these were significantly different from the exhalant seawater. And this was exciting. I was basically just jumping up and down in, the, in my office when I first plotted these um, because we could see that there is some sort of metabolic processing that the sponges are doing to the seawater as they're filtering the, all of that vast amount of seawater on the reef. Um, and then the colors here uh, also, they represent the two different species that I sampled. Um, and the orange actually represents the um, off-reef seawater. And we didn't see um, a difference in the exhalant seawater between those species like I was expecting. Um, but we did have, you know, it was a small sample size. And so I'll be curious to see if um, moving forward with this um, and when we see other studies, um, if this holds or if we do see differences in the exhalant seawater between species. Um, and so now uh, I want to highlight a, um, some of the key results from the targeted uh, work. And I know that there's um, this table has a lot of words and a lot of numbers, um, but I'm just gonna use it to highlight a few things here. 
Um, and so with the targeted work, again, so I was able to, um, I actually knew and could quantify these certain compounds in my samples. And so these were metabolites like amino acids, um, different sugars and uh, nucleosides and vitamins. And so we could actually quantify these in the samples. Um, what I was also able to do was to calculate a pumping rate. And really I got a range of pumping rates for the sponges that I sampled. Um, and those two together allowed me to estimate you know, how much of this metabolite the sponge might be either consuming or releasing over an entire day. And so that's what these last two columns are that I kind of want to draw your attention to. So a minimum and a maximum in picomoles per day. Um, and so as one example, we could see that these sponges were an overall sink for a vitamin, pantothenic acid. Um, and in contrast, uh, they were a source for uh, many of these nucleosides. So these would be uh, things that would be important for building RNA and DNA. And then I also want to highlight these amino acids. Um, and as a, some context or comparison for these numbers, um, the dissolved free amino acids uh, were quantified in Biscayne Bay in Florida and had a range of about 15 to 50 nanomolar. And so what we found is that um, these estimates are sort of the max end of these estimates for some of these amino acids that these sponges may actually be an important source uh, contributing to these uh, nutrient availability um, in this system. And so this really sets up uh, questions for thinking about the impact of sponge-derived DOM and the surrounding seawater and on the microbial community. So what I did was then was able to use these data, these pilot data, um, to help argue that um, we actually currently have an incomplete picture of uh, nutrient dynamics on coral reefs. And so there have been more recent papers that kind of talk about the microbialization of coral reefs. And what this really means is that we see areas with um, high dissolved organic carbon uh, that tend to have this, this type of microbial community. So largely heterotrophic um, and often including opportunistic pathogens um, like some vibrios and others that can be opportunistic pathogens. And this can have um, significant impacts and negative impacts on uh, corals in particular. And we've seen um, diseases, of course, move through many coral reefs, um, particularly just in the last couple of years. And um, of course, these reefs have historically provided um, food, provided coastline protection, but that capacity is greatly reduced when we lose coral cover um, and often see an increase in algal cover and these corresponding changes in the nutrient profile. Um, and oftentimes there may be, as we see these changes with corals and algae, there may be changes in the sponge community, but really those data are very few. Um, many times they're not really uh, recorded in the same way that they are for uh, coral populations or coral cover or algal cover. And so um, I would say that we don't really know what this, piece of the puzzle is doing, but also um, this piece of the puzzle is often not really included. And I think it's an important piece um, that we do include and in try to um, understand their role um, in uh, coverage um, on a coral reef as well as nutrient dynamics. And so um, to start to get at this question and really build on that pilot study that I started um, I was able to team up with some um, other great research, researchers, and we were, have been fortunate to be um, funded recently by NSF to continue this work. So a colleague, uh, Amy April, coral biologist, um, is working on this uh, project with me, as well as other collaborators, Cole Eason at MTSU, Craig Nelson at the University of Hawaii. And then we have some internal collaborators um, at App State that are um, part of the, some of the outreach components that I'll talk a little bit about. And um, we have uh, recently um, added to our team a postdoctoral researcher, uh, Alicia Rigel, uh, 
and she has recently completed her PhD at Louisiana State University in coral microbiomes and um, has been instrumental in getting this project off the ground, which I'll talk about here shortly. Um, so our questions are really this, you know, is there a sponge signal that we could see um, in the surrounding sort of the, the reef level uh, dissolved organic nutrient profile? Um, or does it vary by microbial community, um, the sponge microbial community? Do different sponges produce different uh, nutrient profiles? And so our goal is to use uh, metabolomics methods as well as um, multiple complementary approaches to try to better understand uh, the composition of this dissolved organic nutrient profile and the impact that it has on the surrounding microbial community. And so um, this work was actually supposed to um, uh, get off the ground in summer of 2020 in Curacao, um, but we had to shift gears a little bit for this project as well. So we moved that to somewhere closer. So we were able to get to Moat Marine Lab in the Florida Keys in December, um, which was a huge relief that we could actually get there. So we were able to um, do that and do that safely. And um, so we actually just returned from that trip a few weeks ago, and we're um, pretty excited to start processing um, all of these samples that we have and see if we can um, hopefully soon follow up with some more exciting results to be able to share with you. Um, but I do wanna mention here at least briefly um, the outreach components to these, because both of these grants have outreach as um, a major factor in the project themselves, particularly the first grant um, on the microbial ecology. Um, but I'll, I'll keep this fairly brief here for the sake of time. Um, but I wanna highlight some of the people first here. So this is Jackie Kelleher, who's a master's student working with me on that microbial ecology uh, project. And so she's gonna be taking the lead on um, looking at the nutrient profile um, across species. And uh, an undergraduate, Julie Arn, there we go, uh, Julie Arn, and she has been working closely with uh, Jackie and really both of them also were part of our trip in Florida and were um, instrumental in uh, getting the work done that we needed to do while we were in Florida for the Dissolved Organic uh, Matter project. Um, but also, so Jackie is a, in particular a really great fit for this project. So she is interested not only in the science but is really interested in outreach and science communication. So she has been working um, pretty heavily with Marta Toran, um, who's our outreach uh, person at, um, in biology and in earth and environmental science department. And so uh, Jackie has been working on developing um, some outreach uh, activities as well as material like pamphlets for some of the younger, um, younger kids and then we'll be um, hopefully developing some activities here to build on events that we already have. Like we have something called Watershed Days where we have uh, like hundreds of eighth graders come uh, to the area and we do um, some local kind of freshwater uh, system events with them. Marta has this mobile earth and environmental science lab um, that's really cool. And so we're coming up with activities to bring our research into that. Um, and then we've also been working with kind of Marta and um, Jenny Guybe here in biology um, to develop work with secondary education majors in a couple of ways. So one way is getting um, working on developing a data analysis um, example uh, using sponge data. And that's something that Jackie has also been working on and actually piloted with a group of secondary education majors in Marta's class um, this past fall. And so uh, what our hope is, is that we're thinking about how to kind of bring this research um, into a meaningful way for secondary education majors to both learn about it and for them to bring it into the classroom when they're teachers. And that second part of it is really kind of the last part that we're working towards. Um, and uh, so they have, uh, many of them have this kind of uh, uh, what do I want to say, like a research project that they have to do as secondary education majors. So we'll be working with them um, and working with the local schools to develop some 
uh, hands-on experiments um, for them to do with students. And what that's probably going to center on is actually freshwater sponges that I'll get into next, um, because that provides um, a really nice way to talk about sponge, sponge biology, biodiversity, local habitats, local conservation issues, and then relate that to our research um, and thinking about uh, the biology and ecology of sponges on coral reefs and conservation issues there. So we're trying to kind of link these uh, sponges, using sponges to link these uh, local environments and also to coral reefs. And uh, many people don't know um, that sponges, freshwater sponges exist. And yes, in fact, they do. Um, and that's what I'm gonna talk um, just a little bit about here next. So um, this was a project kind of born out of uh, necessity in some ways. When I first moved here and I was looking for something sort of um, inexpensive, local, easy to do, a good way to get students involved in research, I thought, well, I know freshwater sponges exist. Um, I don't really know a whole lot about them, um, but maybe I can find them. And it turns out that actually finding them was pretty uh, tricky, but we had, um, I had a great group of students. And so we really had some very basic questions like where are these sponges? What are they? Um, do we know anything about the microbial community? And at the time that we started the work, there really hadn't been, uh, there was very, very little, and there still is, I guess, suppose, um, on the microbial community of freshwater sponges. And in the literature, there was sort of this question, um, so many people had thought that freshwater sponges actually have a microbial community that just looks like the water column. There's really no selectivity there. Um, there's no specificity, uh, unlike with marine sponges. And so we thought, well, this is something that we could start to address. So I had um, my first undergraduate student, Victoria Skelly. Um, she and I spent the summer of actually 2016, my first summer here, um, the majority of that time not really finding sponges, but towards the end there we kind of we hit a jackpot and we've been going back to just a few locations that we found every year since then. Um, and so what we started with was to look at the microbial community and we started this um, in sort of a really kind of simple basic way in which we did some uh, cloning. So we took a gene that's commonly used for taxonomy, uh, looking at who is there in the microbial community. And we did the small clone library. So we had 10 clones uh, that presumably were bacterial sequences from the sponge. We sent those out for sequencing. Of those 10, only three were actually bacteria. <laughs> um, but one of those actually had a best match in the database. So we took these sequences, compare them to a database of microbes. Uh, one had this best blast match to a microbe in a sponge in Lake Baikal. So I thought, well, this is pretty crazy and fortunate that out, only out of those three sequences, um, I had one to uh, a sponge in Lake Baikal. So this was exciting because it meant, okay, there's. Um, some microbial symbionts in here that are present in sponge in Western North Carolina with homology, some shared lineage to a sponge in a, a lake in Siberia. And Lake Baikal is, is notable, it's the oldest lake in the world and actually also known for its pretty unique uh, freshwater sponges. Uh, but what, this was the first sign that there is something pretty cool happening here in these freshwater sponges and I wanted to dig into it more. So I teamed up with a colleague to do a little bit um, more sequencing. So rather than cloning, we did some high throughput sequencing. Um, and what I can share here, um, they've had some students present this at conferences, um, and this is really work led by them. So what they're able to do is kind of look at the microbial community in the sponges and then in the water. And here, um, similar to the NMDS, dots that are closer together are more similar in their microbial community. And if they're uh, far apart, then they're different. And kind of the take home message here is that we see this different microbial community in these sponges than in the water. We can also actually we're able to identify kind of groups of certain taxa. And so what we see here is this heat map and the blue color means a relative high abundance of these microbial taxa. So each kind of horizontal line here is a taxa. 
And you can't really um, differentiate that from this image here. There's 300 of them. But what I want to draw your attention to is that we are able to see that there is a group of taxa present in sponges and not present in the surrounding water. Um, and so we've been digging into this more with the groups of um, undergraduate students that I have working on this. Um, and also we're interested to look at their function. And here's where I had a graduate student working uh, recently, uh, looking at a functional profile similar to what I did in my PhD that I talked about in the first slide. So this is kind of a way to view um, what's happening, some of the function of the microbial community and the sponge. And what we were actually initially interested in is sort of this unique feature of freshwater sponges. So freshwater sponges, um, many of them have the ability to form what are these gemmules. There's basically a sphere, a little packet, um, like a survival pod of sponge material. And so um, in harsh conditions like winter or drought, the adult tissue would deteriorate and you're left with these gemmules that can then hatch into a new sponge. And with some help from some colleagues, um, April Hill and Malcolm Hill, uh, the graduate student and I were able to get some gemmules to hatch. So that's this alien looking thing that you see here on the right. And these brown kind of circles are gemmules. And these have actually grown into um, the tissue, the sponge that you see here. And this is actually an osculum of the sponge. Um, and so what she's been working on and we're um, I hope getting getting close to sort of writing this up. So hopefully um, you can keep an eye out for this soon. Um, was her meta transcriptome work that we actually uh, did on adult tissue, um, but we're seeing some interesting things um, that we can find in here about symbiosis factors, about transient versus long term symbionts interaction with the host, um, and we hope to eventually be able to do some manipulation with this. So um, I want to highlight the kind of freshwater sponge microbe team. Um, I've had a wonderful group of undergraduates um, and a graduate student here who presented um, most of this work that I've shown you at a conference. Um, our last conference that we were able to go to, which was in 2019. Um, and many of the, these students have actually recently graduated, but we've had um, then some additional students who've taken on the project over the last year and a half, probably. Um, and then this is what it looks like. So collecting these guys out in the field, we've got some students collecting that. And one of the things that we're working on is also trying to be able to kind of localize these symbionts in the sponge tissue using uh, fluorescent in situ hybridization. Um, so lots, lots to do on all of these fronts with marine sponges and freshwater sponges. Um, and with that, I want to thank you for your attention and um, thank the hosts for inviting me. Um, I want to acknowledge my funding um, from NSF, um, as well as some internal funding, uh, graduate students, postdoc, um, wonderful collaborators and mentors that I've had, um, and of course, the wonderful students that I have. Um, and then lastly here, um, we were actually very lucky. So we had planned in uh, the Panama project to do the sponge taxonomy and ecology workshop in the third year of our grant. Um, but we ended up switching it to the first year, 2019, um, which turns out was a really good thing. Um, and we were able to work with colleagues from Brazil and from France and from around the US um, to do fun, some fun sponge ecology and microbiology in Panama. Um, so with that, um, thank you for your attention and your time this evening. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Cara. That was lovely. Um, so it's time for the discussion and the questions. So if you have a question, as I mentioned before, uh, either type a question mark in the chat or raise your hand and I'll uh, call out your name so you can ask a question. I'm just scrolling through the names. I don't think we have a question at the moment. So perhaps I will start uh, with a question. Um, so one thing I was thinking about uh, while you were you're talking was um, last week we had a lecture about uh, coral microbiomes. And I remember the speaker there talking about um, how within an individual coral, you have sort of different uh, 
microbial communities in different layers. So you'll have a different um, microbial community in the mucus, for example, that will differ uh, from the actual uh, the rest of the coral body and the skeleton, etc. And I think there is uh, some evidence for sponges as well for a sort of a stratification of these um, communities. And uh, so I was wondering, given that you talked about how different types of microbes are using different resources in terms of DOM or POM or actually being more inorganic cyclers, uh, whether you would expect uh, a stratification within the sponge in terms of their roles in nutrition, in terms of the roles of the microbes in the nutrition. Yeah, um, so it is, and it's a fun question to think about. Um, and so I think, I mean, from what we know right now, which I'd say is very little, um, that we uh, know that some of those, um, at least for things like uh, cyanobacteria, some of the, the photosymbionts, we can see those pretty easily um, in the outermost layers of the, of the sponge. And then um, as far as stratification kind of within the inner layers, um, I would expect that some of that you know, is going to be driven by differences in kind of micro, um, micro habitats of oxygen availability um, or level. Um, but as far as uh, specific metabolism beyond that, um, I don't think we know yet, and I'm excited to find out. So, uh, and from some of my PhD work, when I was looking at the kind of the different metabolism present in Zestospongia muta, we could see things like, oh, there's there's some microbes that are potentially doing like anaerobic um, uh, uh, dissimilatory uh, nitrate reduction to ammonia, and so some anaerobic processes that we weren't really expecting. So that to me tells us that somewhere within there, there is some either low or low oxygen or anaerobic environments. And those are probably gonna have some uh, different uh, uh, metabolism, different symbionts than you would find in maybe more oxygenated layers. Um, I don't know if that really answers your question there, but I think that we're just starting to kind of see some of that and um, it's fun to explore for sure. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Uh, we, ha we have some more questions. So there's a question uh, from Alexander Parry, if you'd like to turn your microphone on. Hello. Uh, so I know a big focus has been on the nitrogen and the carbon, uh, but especially when I think of microbes and nitrogen, I think of iron, molybdenum, uh, other metals that are necessary for the processing of these elements. Uh, is there any evidence, especially even sponges, uh, with the sponges in the coral reefs where iron is very limiting, that they're playing a major cycling role? Yeah, um, uh, as far as I know, uh, I have seen that mentioned in the literature, but I don't think anybody has actually investigated that as to what kind of, uh, whether iron is a limiting factor. So we know that in, with marine microbes, that iron is a really important trace nutrient and can have um, pretty significant impacts in the free living microbial community. Um, but really, at least that I know of, there hasn't really been any comparable work in sponges. Um, but it would be fascinating to see because I'm sure, you know, these microbes that are in there, they need you know, iron um, as cofactors um, for a variety of metabolic processes, like you said, and what that impact is on the availability, um, I don't know. Um, but it's a, an interesting thought. Thank you. All right. And we have another question by Angela Marulanda. If you'd like to unmute yourself. Hi, this is actually Ben Mueller. We are watching it together, so uh, she doesn't have such a, a deep voice. Uh, <laughs> thank you, uh, Kara, for a super interesting talk. Uh, it was really nice to see all these things coming together. And I was uh, wondering, as you mentioned, that the sponges directly also affect with the exhalant water the composition of uh, 
of the seawater uh, what you have there and that it may also play a role in a microbialization of reefs that is it adds another piece to it not just having corals and algae uh, what do you think if you would have to hypothesize what would be or what could be the roles of sponges in this microbialization do you think that they are rather kind of a uh, driven community that is affected by whatever corals or algae are there, or do you think that they, to a certain point, may also drive um, in what direction the, uh, uh, the, the reef is shifting? Yeah, um, so great question. Thanks, Ben. I'm glad you're able to, to make the talk. Um, so my, you know, it's, it's certainly hard to say, but my thought is that I, I'm very curious to see, I guess, if sponges um, actually play a beneficial role in uh, structuring nutrients on a coral reef. And so I, I'm expecting that when we look at the nutrient profile, that it's probably going to be different from either algae and, or corals. Um, <clears throat> but what I'm thinking um, or very curious to see is if uh, they tend to also drive a more autotrophic community in the same way that corals do, um, rather than a uh, more heterotrophic community like algae. Um, so that's sort of my, at least my hypothesis going into it for that. Um, and then as far as what kind of role in sort of driving, you know, the um, sort of bigger scale pictures of ecology on these reefs, um, it is, it's hard to say. And my, my thought, and maybe I'm a little biased here and because um, we all, we love sponges, I, my thought is that they are going to be um, maybe beneficial in a way um, for even for coral assemblages and potentially beneficial for growth of corals and for help maintaining healthy coral reefs. Um, but we do know, right, that sponges are certainly, in terms of the ecology, would be another kind of space competitor uh, in the same way, you know, algae would be competing for space, corals are competing for space. Um, that I will probably not touch on quite as much, but um, in terms of the nutrient dynamics, I think that we are going to see that they are a major player and have an important role in the overall reef nutrient profile, just like corals do. if that helps. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we have another question uh, from Matthew Van Damme. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for the uh, excellent talk. Um, I had a question about freshwater sponges. Um, this is sort of entomological, um, but have you ever found a Cicereidae or the spongilla flies on the freshwater sponges? They're a neuropteroid um, insect which, which only feeds on them and are quite unusual. Yeah, I, so I have heard of them only since starting to work on these freshwater sponges. Um, and I haven't come across them myself, but um, I actually started um, reaching out to people to see if I could get um, information on where they're found in hopes of trying to build a better picture of where we find freshwater sponges because they're surprisingly patchy. Um, you'll find them in just one particular stretch of a river um, and not anywhere else, at least that we've looked kind of along that river. And so um, I'm, and if you know of the distribution of that, um, that insect, I'm actually happy to hear, hear about that. Um, but I haven't found them uh, in particular yet, but maybe uh, in the next couple of seasons, we'll, we'll come across one. Yeah, we, we can certainly look in the collection and see. Okay, <laughs> that would be great, actually. Yeah. Oh, that's very interesting. I, I had no idea. <laughs> um, so we have also a question in the chat that I just noticed from Leima, who is asking, how was your experience using the crowdfunding platform? Uh, what made you use it and would you do it again? Yeah, um, it was an overall positive experience, I'd say. Um, it was more difficult than I probably anticipated going into it. Um, and so um, 
I think what I found in sort of uh, going through it <laughs> was that, so that was also the first time like I got on Twitter and tried to get on Instagram. I really haven't stayed on there very much, but um, you know, and, and on Twitter, so I was working with Experiment and they're like, oh great, we'll help you get the word out and we'll do all these things. If you make some blog posts, we'll share them. But of course the thing about Twitter is that no one sees it unless you have followers. So you kind of first have to get followers and then you can kind of get the word out. Um, and um, it happened slowly. So um, what I learned there was that um, what would be really helpful is to kind of have a network already in place. and. Um, one thing that I did in addition to sort of the social media platforms was um, I contacted a dive shop and um, or actually a couple of dive shops in Florida, in the Florida Keys. And I knew that we were going, if we got funding, that we'd be going to do the work in the Florida Keys. And so I asked them like if I, I could kind of put a little blurb together with some nice pictures and they could put this in their dive shop and try and get people you know, to, to see this and read about it and maybe they'd wanna fund some coral reef work. And that actually was probably even better than the social media platform, um, part, in part maybe because I was just starting on social media, but um, it also allowed me to reach, the hardest thing with it was reaching beyond like immediate friends and family, right? How do you get beyond that and um, with your networking? Because those are not the people that you really want funding your science, right? Um, and that was the hardest part, but once you get that, and if you can plan for that ahead of time, then it's actually a really great experience and works well for, you know, something small like this, like a, a, a pilot project, so. Um, uh, yeah, so I recommend it, but having a, a network in place was crucial. Thank you. So I yeah. think we're going to have to wrap it up soon. Um, uh, I just wanted to quickly say uh, for those of you at the Academy and beyond, uh, next week I believe we do not have a seminar. Ale, correct me if I'm wrong. And that we're, uh, we, uh, yeah, we have a staff meeting and then we are resuming on the 18th of February um, with um, an evolutionary ecologist, Dr. Scott Taylor from the University of Colorado, who will be our invited speaker. Uh, so, yeah, stay tuned for that. Thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you, Cara, so much for sharing your insights with us. And I hope you've all enjoyed it and have a nice evening. So Michelle, so I will, do you want to stay on um, here uh, to chat more? Thank you all. Yeah, I, I guess we can stay here. I think people will be um, signing off. <laughs> okay. yeah. Cara, I don't know if you're reading the messages, but it's a lot of uh, a lot of people saying awesome talk. Thank you very much. Oh, um, great. Oh, nice. Yeah. Great. Thank you. I actually yeah, have I was a, worried if I like go through things too fast or just like no 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 it was much. super well nice explained. right yeah 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 it was great for the audience because you know most of the people wouldn't have a sponge background so it was good that you you know took okay. us by the hand and uh, okay great yeah, definitely <laughs> good good to hear thanks yeah, because I was actually, I was thinking, I'm like, oh, I was thinking I'm emailing you to check just to see what kind of the range was. And I'm like, oh, we should just, it's the maybe the teacher in me will target it to her just in case nobody knows what a sponge is or anything. Yeah, that was perfect. Yeah. Yeah, I think that, I mean, the seminars at the Academy tend to be quite um, broad and many very different topics. Mm -hmm. um, makes sense. So... And yeah, like you saw, there was entomologists in the audience. Yeah, and, yeah. So, that was yeah. really great, actually. That was perfect. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that's so interesting. So they feed on the sponge, but like, so the sponges are pretty shallow then, right? Or like, how, how does that work? Yeah, they are. So yeah. um, for the most part, we can um, basically wade in in the river. Well, actually, as um, so Alicia is here and we, <laughs> Other than uh, a few times where it floods. <laughs> yeah, Hello. sorry. Um, Hi. Yeah, Hi. so uh, Alicia, yep, the postdoc was working with us. Um, so we have uh, Michelle and Alejandra right here. Good to see um, you, Alicia. To meet you.
Yeah, and um, so actually now Alicia has been wading into the river with me a few times. <laughs> and at one point, um, so normally it's probably anywhere from ankle to knee deep, um, but we were, it had rained a lot. What was at the end of the summer? And it was we an ill-fated trip. Like, waist waist deep and then we just had to turn around like we just can't get it any further without getting washed away it was like fast rolling water it was like it, we got in and i was like this is a bad idea <laughs> you need to sort of go rafting to get your sample yeah actually yep um so but mo for the most part it tends to be you know maybe uh anywhere from knee deep to a little bit deeper than that and um and so we can kind of go in and just like go through and like have to like pick up rocks because you actually find them mostly on the underside of rocks, surprisingly. Um, whereas I was kind of expecting maybe either surface or side, but we actually sometimes on the side, but a lot of times they're under. Be willing to bet because of the where they're located, they're not harboring a lot of photosymbionts just because they tend to be like carousel on the underside. Of yeah. The and and actually along those lines, so one thing that's really cool is that you see sometimes they're they're growing sort of on the 